Part 46, Section 8, The Christian and His Neighbour. Have you got neighbours? Are you friends or enemies? We're looking at the parable of the Good Samaritan. True religion consists of active service for others. We're doing a series on others, not us so much. On this, eternal destiny depends. Our eternal destiny depends on our active service, amongst other things, of other people in need. Contact with suffering humanity frees the soul of selfishness. You know, we're born selfish. Look at your kids when they grew up. Selfish. We were born with this. What do you call it? And uh, contact with suffering humanity frees the soul of selfishness. You forget about yourself when you visit a dying uh, cancer patient. Hmm. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. They were always testing him. He always had spies in his audience. They wanted to kill him from the beginning. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Look 10. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. What a life if you live this. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Robbers. A priest happened, fortunately, a priest happened to be going down the same road. And this poor victim heard the footsteps. He, he, he got me hope. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But the Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. Of course, you know the connotation of a Samaritan in Jewish thinking in those days. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. What a kind Samaritan. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Among the Jews, the question, who is my neighbor, caused endless dispute. <laughs> Can you imagine this? Hey, who's my neighbor? What do you think? They had no doubt as to the heathen and to the Samaritans. These were strangers and enemies. Remember, they were exclusive, not inclusive. Now they're looking for the neighbor in their exclusive uh, surroundings. But where should the distinction be made among the people of their own nation and among the different classes of society? This, this, was, this was their talk. Whom should the priest the rabbi, the elder regard as a neighbor. They spent their lives in a round of ceremonies to make themselves pure. Contact with the ignorant and careless multitude, they taught, would cause defilement 
that would require wearisome effort to remove. Were they to regard the unclean as neighbors? This was a question, debate. Hey man, do you think we should regard the unclean people as our neighbor? This question, Christ answered, and it's an answer that, that we can accept as well. This question Christ answered in the parable of the Good Samaritan. He showed that our neighbor does not mean merely one of the church or faith to which we belong. So, leave it at that. It has no reference to race, color or class distinction. I like the way Jesus explains stuff to me. I've got so much to learn. Our neighbor is every person, Jesus says, who needs our help. I think we've got a lot of neighbors. And you know of people that need your help. Our neighbor is every soul who is wounded and bruised by the adversary, the devil, or his enemies. Every soul who is wounded and bruised, you know about them. Our neighbor is everyone who is the property of God. In other words, every single person I meet is my neighbor. The parable of the Good Samaritan was called forth by a question put to Christ by a doctor of the law. As the Saviour was teaching, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Of course, they had a system which they practiced to get into heaven. But he's asking an opinion of this, this new rabbi that came to the, to the scene. The Pharisees had suggested this question to the lawyer in the hope that they might entrap Christ in his words. And they listened eagerly for his answer. So they prompted him to ask Jesus the question. Of course, he was a learned man in the law. But the Saviour entered into no controversy. He wasn't interested in a dialogue. He required the answer from the questioner himself. He was a master handling situations. What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? The Jews still accused Jesus of likely regarding the law given from Sinai, but he turned the question of salvation upon the keeping of God's commandments. <laughs> They couldn't win an argument with him. I like this. He answered me, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. The lawyer was not satisfied with the position and works of the Pharisees. This is interesting. <laughs> yeah, he didn't like the emphasis. He had been studying the scriptures with a desire to learn the real meaning. He had a vital interest in the matter and he asked in, in sincerity, what shall I do to be saved? Maybe you've asked the question too. What shall I do to be saved? Because every one of us wants to be saved. In his answer as to the requirements of the law, he passed by all the mass of ceremonial and ritualistic precepts. For these he claimed no value, but presented the two great principles on which hang all the law and the prophets. Love your head. Love for your neighbor and love for God. The Savior's commendation of this answer placed him on vantage ground with the rabbis. They could not condemn him for sanctioning that which had been advanced by an expositor of 
the law. Do this and you will live, Christ said. Do this and you will live, my friend, said Jesus. In his teaching, he ever presented the law as a divine unity, showing that it is impossible to keep one precept and break another, for the same principle runs through all. There's unity in the commandments. Have you ever checked if you are obeying all of, all of the ten? Man's destiny will be determined by his obedience to the whole law. Christ knew that no one could obey the law in his own strength, of course. He desired to lead the lawyer to clearer and more critical research as he might find the truth. So that he might find the truth. So this is an interesting debate. Only by accepting the virtue and grace of Christ can we keep the law. And the doctor in the law was not aware of this. It's not a mechanical exercise. Believe in the propitiation, that's the divine favor, for sin enables fallen man to love God with his whole heart and his neighbor as himself. Propitiation, divine favor. Only by God's divine favor can we accomplish this. The lawyer knew that he had kept neither the first four nor the last six commandments. <laughs> this is so interesting. He knew he didn't. He was convicted under Christ's searching words. But instead of confessing his sin, he tried to excuse it. Rationalize. You know, we rationalize when we make a mistake. Yes, but you, you started the argument first, man, and now I was tired. We make excuses. We rationalize. Rather than acknowledge the truth, he endeavored to show how difficult of fulfillment the commandment is. Oh, Jesus, this is a difficult thing to do. Thus he hoped both to avert conviction and to vindicate himself in the eyes of the people as an image, of course, as well. The Saviour's words had shown that his question was needless since he was able to answer it himself. Yet he put another question, saying, and Jesus, uh, tell me, who is my neighbor, according you, to your view? Again, Christ refused to be drawn into controversy. Brilliant. He answered the question by relating an incident, the memory of which was fresh in the minds of his hearers. This was front page news in the Jerusalem Herald. <laughs> Everybody knew what happened there. And they were so ashamed of the priest and the Levite. And they didn't like the Samaritan. So this was quite a, a subject to discuss. A certain man, Jesus said, went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's downhill all the way. 400 meters below sea level. And he fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment. He was naked. And wounded him. And departed, leaving him half dead. In journeying from Jerusalem to Jericho, the traveler had to pass through a portion of the wilderness of Judea. This is a barren place. And they've erected a little building shrine there where it happened. Uh, you go up and then you go down. So the thieves uh, 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 lived in the caves. They put themselves in the cave so when you came there they could they could rob you. In journeying from Jerusalem to Jericho, the traveller had to pass through a portion of the wilderness of Judea. The road led down a wild, rocky ravine, which was infested with robbers and was often the scene of violence. Here you can see what it looks like. It was in this area that the traveller was attacked stripped of all that was valuable and left half dead by the wayside. 
As he lay thus, a priest came that way. He saw the man lying wounded and bruised, wallowing in his own blood. But he left him without rendering any assistance. He passed by on the other side. Are we passing by on the other side? Something to think about. There's somebody that needs your loving care. Then a Levite appeared. Curious to know what had happened, he stopped and looked at the sufferer. He was convicted of what he ought to do, but it was not an agreeable duty. He wished that he had not come that way, so that he would not have seen the wounded man. He persuaded himself that the case was no concern of his. He too passed by on the other side. These are men of the cloth, uh, children of God, supposed to be, passing by. Am I passing by? I remember when I did a course in uh, counselling, a question was asked to me. You're on your way, you've got to meet an appointment. But on the way you saw somebody lying on the, on the pavement. If you attend to him, you you lose that uh, appointment that you should attend, which could affect your future. Uh, have you ever had a question like this? Maybe. Pass by on the other side. Am I a passer by on the other side? But the Samaritan, the dogs, the outcasts, Travelling the same road, they were so prejudiced, they, they felt that God could not bestow salvation upon the Samaritans. They were too bad. But the Samaritan, travelling the same road, saw the sufferer. And he did the work that the others had refused to do, with gentleness and kindness. He ministered to the wounded man. Oh, friend, I'm so sorry. I'm here to help you. And he touched him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey while he walked, brought him to an inn and took care of him. Beautiful. A Samaritan. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will come again. When I come again, I will repay you. What? Paying for him, and if there's a serious problem, and they need to, to use some extra medical uh, stuff, he will repay for that. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. This is what God expects from us. People lying on the road of life, being robbed of their purity, their status. It's not passed by. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. What an honest man. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, You showed mercy on him. He didn't mention the name Samaritan. <laughs> then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. He says to us, Go and do likewise. The, the priest and the Levite both professed piety, but the Samaritan showed that he was truly converted. 
it was no more agreeable for him to do the work than for the priests and the Levite. But in the spirit and works he proved himself to be in harmony with God. He was in harmony with God. In giving this lesson, Christ presented the principle of the law in a direct, forcible way, showing his hearers that they had neglected to carry out these principles. They said they were abiding law people. No, they were not. <laughs> they didn't care about God. They didn't care about the neighbor. His words were so definite and pointed that the listeners could find no opportunity to quarrel. The lawyer found in the lesson nothing that he could criticize. Brilliant man. His prejudice regarding Christ was removed. But he had not overcome his national dislike sufficiently to give credit to the Samaritan by name. He should have said a Samaritan. When Christ asked, which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He answered, the one who had mercy on him. No mention of the nationality of this man. Then Jesus said unto him, go and do likewise. Show the same tender kindness to those in need, my friend, you're a doctor of the law. Thus you will give evidence, thus you will give evidence that you keep the whole law. The great difference between the Jews and the Samaritans was a difference in religious belief. A question as to what constitutes true worship. The Samaritan said, this is true worship. The Jews said, no, this is true worship. The Pharisees would say nothing good of the Samaritans, but poured their bitterest curses upon them. So strong was the hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans that to the Samaritan woman he it seemed a strange thing for Christ to ask her for a drink because Jews didn't speak to her. They spat on her. She was a dog. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. John 4 verse 9. How can you speak to me? I'm, I'm just a Samaritan and you're a Jew. She, she was so surprised. But this was a different Jew. This was the Son of God, the ruler of the universe, that put on humble clothes and the human nature. And he cared for the Samaritans. was in his circle of love. And when the Jews were so filled with murderous hatred against Christ that they rose in the temple to stone him, they could find no better words by which to express the hatred. Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? If you would tell a Jew that he is a Samaritan, this was the, the greatest insult you could have given him. They said to Jesus, you're a Samaritan. You are demon possessed like the Samaritans. Yet the priest and the Levite neglected the very work the Lord had enjoined on them, leaving a hated and despised Samaritan to minister to one of their own countrymen. The Samaritan had fulfilled the command. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as yourself, thus showing that he was more righteous than those by life. He had entreated the wounded man as his brother. This Samaritan represents Christ. Our Savior manifested us a love that the love of man can never equal. So we are the wounded. 
and he manifested a love that cannot be equaled. When we were bruised and dying, he had pity on us. He did not pass by on the other side and leave us helpless and hopeless to perish. What a God! I'm so glad for such a Saviour. He did not remain in his holy, happy home where he was beloved by all the heavenly hosts. He beheld our sore need. He undertook our case and those of humanity. I want to read it again. He beheld our sore need. You know, we, we're in need of him. And he undertook our case. What was our case? Our hopeless case. And those of humanity. Every, everybody. He died to save his enemies. He prayed for his murderers. What a saviour. What an example to follow. More and more. I want to be like Jesus. Pointing to his own example, he says to his followers, These things I command you, that ye love one another, now, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. God wants you and I to love people. You know, sometimes we just look at somebody and we, we're upset. God wants us to love people, the unlovely people. The priest and the Levite had been for worship to the temple whose service was appointed by God himself. To participate in that service was a great and exalted privilege. And the priest and the Levite felt that having been thus honoured, it was beneath them to minister to an, to an unknown sufferer by the wayside. Thus they neglected the special opportunity which God had offered them as his agents to bless a fellow being. This is religion, not sitting in a church so much. Next time, are we making the same mistakes? How do I keep a balance between serving God and serving people in need? How can I give the theory of theology a practical face? Father in heaven, at times we walked by on the other side. Thank you that you in Christ did not walk on the other side. But you came to us bruised, bleeding and dying. And you healed our wounds. And you paid for our medical, spiritual medical expenses on the cruel cross of Calvary. Help us to be more kind. In Jesus' name. Amen.